When we encounter plagiarism in the world, it's often cases where one writer has copied the work of another. An author whose book contains passages from another author's work, lines from a speech that were previously delivered by a different speaker. But, in, but most cases of plagiarism are inadvertent. The writer plagiarizes without realizing they are doing it. In these cases of plagiarism, the cause isn't a lack of professional ethics. It's a lack of understanding or skill. The writer doesn't understand the conventions for fairly using another writer's work, or they don't have the writing skills to carry out these conventions. I'm Ryan Wepler, director of Yale's Graduate Writing Lab. In this video, I'll describe the expectations for fairly incorporating a source's ideas and language into your own work. I'll also discuss strategies for summary and paraphrase, two important techniques for using sources. When used incorrectly, summary and paraphrase can inadvertently lead to plagiarism. When used effectively, summary and paraphrase can help place your work in conversation with other scholars, and they allow you to express the impact of your ideas on the field. Before we begin, I'd like to make one clarification. When I talk about what is and isn't considered plagiarism, I'm talking about the conventions of the American Academy. One thing that makes discussing plagiarism so challenging is that the conventions for fairly using another scholar's work can differ significantly from one culture to the next. At the same time, the nuances of for a fair paraphrase and summary are often unclear to American students. In this presentation, we'll explore those nuances by breaking down examples of paraphrase and summary. Let's start with definitions. When you paraphrase, you rewrite a passage from a source in your own words. Your paraphrase will typically be about the same length as the original passage, possibly a little shorter. It will include about the same level of detail as the original passage, perhaps omitting one or two details that aren't relevant for your paper. When you paraphrase, you want to rewrite the source's language with the terminology you use in your paper. This will help your audience understand how the source's ideas relate to your own. And as you must when you use any source, a paraphrase must be cited. Now let's define summary. When you summarize, you condense a longer passage. This could range anywhere from rewriting the main idea of a source paragraph as a single sentence to restating the key finding of an entire paper. As we've just described, a summary is typically much shorter than the original passage. Unlike paraphrase, summary cuts most or all of the details from a source to focus on a key idea. When you summarize, you're being selective, including only ideas that are relevant to your paper. And as with paraphrase, summary must be cited. As you can probably tell, summary and paraphrase have a lot in common. Both involve rewriting a source's language in your own words. By changing the source's words, both focus the, focus the audience's attention on the ideas of the source rather than its language. As with most choices you make when you write, the primary goal of summary and paraphrase is clear communication. At their core, these are techniques for making ideas as clear as possible for your reader. Now let's consider how summary and paraphrase differ from one another. Paraphrase is used primarily as an alternative to quoting. Unlike a quote, it places the reader's focus on the ideas of the source rather than its language. And paraphrase makes your writing clearer because you can present the source's idea using the perspective and terminology you've already established in your paper, and which your reader is already familiar with. Summary, on the other hand, condenses a passage that is too long to have quoted in the first place. It's a technique for saving space. You use summary to isolate a key idea relevant to your paper. This makes your writing clearer by eliminating irrelevant details that might obscure your reader's understanding. To help us explore the line between a fair paraphrase and a paraphrase that reproduces a source's language too closely, let's look at an example. Consider this passage from Cass Sunstein's book, Going to Extremes. When people talk to like-minded others, they tend to amplify their pre-existing views, and to do so in a way that reduces their internal diversity. We see this happen in politics. It happens in families, businesses, churches and synagogues, and student organizations as well. Now assess this paraphrase of Sunstein's passage. When talking to others who think like them, people typically strengthen their pre-existing views, which reduces the group's internal diversity. This happens in student groups, religious communities, 
businesses, families, and politics. I'm now going to pause 10 seconds for you to consider, is this a fair paraphrase? Why or why not? Although it changes some of the source's language, this is not a fair paraphrase. Let's look closer to understand why. First, the language of a paraphrase must be changed enough to be considered the writer's own. And some of the wordings in this paraphrase are too close to the source's language. Like-minded others is very close to others who think like them. Amplify their pre-existing views is almost the same as strengthen their pre-existing views and reduces their internal diversity is nearly identical to reduces the group's internal diversity. In addition to the language of this paraphrase being too similar to the language of the source, the ideas are presented in the same order. It seems unlikely that the paraphrase writer would have structured their sentence so similarly had they not read the source text. So we can't consider the writing of the paraphrase wholly their own. Now let's look at the last sentence of the passage. Here, the source text lists five kinds of groups, politics, families, businesses, churches and synagogues, and student organizations. The paraphrase reverses the order of the items on the list. It even attempts a more thorough rewriting by changing some of the language. Churches and synagogues to religious communities and student organizations to student groups. But even arranged differently with some different language, this paraphrase phrased list is essentially the same as the one we encountered in the source text, which makes this plagiarism. The presentation of the ideas simply hasn't changed enough for us to say that this writing originated with the author. Having looked at an example, let's consider some principles of paraphrase. As I discussed in the first video on academic honesty, writers are considered to own not just their ideas, but their language. As a result, the language of your source must be changed substantively enough to be considered your own. Any ambiguity that would allow a reader to mistake language or expression that comes from a source as coming from you could be considered plagiarism. And because paraphrase doesn't tend to use quotations, you don't have many tools for signaling aspects of the writing that came from a source. Looking at the first sentence of our example, we saw that simply replacing a source's words with synonyms is not enough for the presentation of an idea to be considered your own. And since word order also originates with a source, it too could be plagiarized. Turning to the second sentence of our example shows us that placing a sequence of words or ideas in a different order can also constitute plagiarism. So, how much do you have to change a source text to make it your own? And how do you do it? To take up this question, Let's return to our passage from Sunstein, which I'll now read again. When people talk to like-minded others, they tend to amplify their pre-existing views and to do so in a way that reduces their internal diversity. We see this happen in politics. It happens in families, businesses, churches and synagogues, and student organizations as well. Now consider this paraphrase. Sunstein describes how the similarity of views within a group affects the beliefs of individual members. Studies across a wide range of groups have found that associating with individuals who think like you strengthens what you already believe and reduces the diversity of beliefs within the group. Like last time, I'll pause for 10 seconds to allow you to consider whether this is a fair paraphrase. If you thought the passage was paraphrased fairly, I agree with you. Let's think about why and, more importantly, what strategies the writer used to make the language their own. Consider how this passage is paraphrased. They tend to amplify their pre-existing views and to do so in a way that it reduces their internal diversity. It's rewritten as, strengthens what you already believe 
and reduces the diversity of beliefs within the group. Right away, we notice that nearly all of the language has changed. Diversity and reduces are the only words common to each passage. The writer also shifted where these ideas appear within the larger passage, taking ownership of how the ideas are presented by restructuring them. Looking at another passage, we see the phrase, when people talk to like-minded others, rewritten as similarity of views within a group and associating with individuals who think like you. Here the paraphrased passages restate the source's ideas without using any of the same words. But they alter the source text in other ways as well. The first introduces the concept of a group, elaborating a bit on the source's ideas. And by repeating a single passage in two different ways, the paraphrase adds emphasis that wasn't found in the source. Now let's look at what the paraphrase does to that list in the second sentence. It takes the phrase, we see this happen in politics, it happens in families, businesses, churches and synagogues, and student organizations as well, and condenses it to studies across a wide range of groups. Here the writer takes ownership of the source's language by synthesizing a list of details into a single category, which conveys the point clearly. Finally, let's look at the phrase, affects the beliefs of individual group members, which doesn't appear in the source text at all. Like many successful paraphrases, this one gives voice to an unstated implication in the source. Using this paraphrase technique helps a writer take ownership of a source by bringing to the surface an idea that is relevant to their own argument. Stepping back and looking at the two passages as a whole, shows us how the paraphrase writer hasn't just changed the source's language. They have significantly reorganized how the ideas are presented. The first sentence of the paraphrase frames the details we encounter in the second sentence, which gives it a wholly different function from the first sentence of the source text. The list at the end of the source now appears in the middle of the paraphrase, and the information in the source's first sentence has shifted to the end. Now that we've explored an example, Let's consider strategies for par fairly paraphrasing a source text. Most fundamentally, you need to change the language of the source text significantly enough for the wording to be considered your own. One strategy for making that happen is to elaborate an element of the original passage that's relevant for your paper. Similarly, you might use repetition to emphasize a relevant idea. You can effectively rewrite a source's language by condensing unnecessary details in the source text. Generating language for ideas that are only implied in the source is another way to craft original language. And reordering the ideas in a, in a source passage can help you craft an original structure. Writers who want to find the line between fair paraphrase and too close paraphrase often ask how many words they can borrow from a source before a paraphrase becomes plagiarism. To answer this question, we need to think more deeply about what it means for a piece of language to originate with an author. To do this, let's consider another example. This one from Steven Pinker's book, The Language Instinct. A close examination of what it takes to put words together into ordinary sentences reveals that mental language mechanisms must have a complex design with many interacting parts. Under this microscope, the babble of languages no longer appear to vary in arbitrary ways and without limit. One now sees a common design to the machinery underlying the world's language, a universal grammar. Now consider this paraphrase. Pinker argues that a close examination of language reveals complex structures hidden within its design. These hidden structures, he suggests, share common characteristics across the vast range of global languages revealing what he calls, quote, a universal grammar. Again, I'll pause for 10 seconds so you can consider whether this is a fair paraphrase. I would judge this a fair paraphrase for several of the reasons we just discussed. It significantly changes the language of the source text, and it condenses the source by eliminating less relevant details. To better understand the line between fair paraphrase and too close paraphrase, let's dig a little deeper. 
One thing you may have noticed is that both passages include the same four-word phrase, a close examination of. Why is this not plagiarism? To understand why it isn't, consider how many times you've heard the phrase, a close examination of. Or, more importantly, consider how many different people you've heard say it. This combination of words didn't originate with any of them, so it can't be considered an original creation by any of them. Put differently, many people have said this phrase, so no one owns it. The line for plagiarism is when a specific combination of words becomes original enough to be considered the, a creation of their author. But how many words is that? As you probably noticed, I placed Pinker's phrase, a universal grammar, in quotation marks. This phrase is only three words, but I felt it was original enough to Pinker that I needed quotes to make clear that the words are his and not mine. Pinker did not invent the phrase, a universal grammar, but the way he uses this terminology in this context seemed original to him. So I felt it was important to present the specific language he used and to clarify that the language came from him. So what does this show us? It demonstrates that there's no specific number of words at which a paraphrase crosses the line into plagiarism. Repeating a single word from a source can be plagiarism if the source used it in an original way and the paraphrase leaves ambiguity about whether that word may have been written by you. Conversely, a string of four, five, six words or longer can be included in a paraphrase if that phrase is too common in the language to be considered the creation of your source. Before leaving our paraphrase examples behind, I'd like to explore one more issue related to paraphrase. As you may have noticed, both examples of fair paraphrase have included the source author's name in the paraphrase itself. This example refers to Pinker in the first word and cites him as the source of specific ideas or language in two other places. These references to a source author within the paraphrase are called author prominent citations. Author prominent citations can help you signal which ideas are your own and which originate from a source. So they can be a useful tool for avoiding plagiarism. That said, the conventions of many disciplines, especially scientific disciplines, tend to discourage author prominent citation in, in favor of citations that do not refer to the author in the text. These are called information prominent citations because the paraphrase refers only to the information from the source and limits any reference to the author to a footnote or parentheses. Most disciplines do make room for author prominent citations when referring specifically to something that the author did, the methodology of a study, for example, but otherwise place the focus only on the information found in sources. Although author prominent citations can help you signal more clearly which ideas came from your sources, you'll want to make sure you know the conventions of your discipline so that you can follow them. What have we learned from our latest example that we can add to our principles of fair paraphrase? Most broadly, we learned that there is no exact number of copied words that turns a fair paraphrase into plagiarism. To judge whether a paraphrase is fair or plagiarized, you must assess whether the wording can be considered original to the author. From this principle, it follows that common phrases used in common ways that are not original to the source can be rewritten in a paraphrase. And original ter terminology or existing terminology used in an original way is considered the creation of an author. This could be a piece of text as short as a single word. These types of original phrasings cannot be used in a paraphrase without clarifying that the terminology originated with the source. Let's conclude our discussion of paraphrase by making one addition to our list of fair paraphrase strategies. When allowed by disciplinary conventions, Using the author's name in a paraphrase can help clarify which language and ideas came from a source and which are your own. We've spent most of our time discussing paraphrase, a complex and versatile way of engaging with sources. To finish, let's explore summary. As we've discussed, summary condenses a longer passage down to its most important idea. As I read this passage from Oliver Sacks' book, Hallucinations, consider how you might condense it into a summary that expresses its main idea. When you conjure up ordinary images of a rectangle or a friend's face or the Eiffel Tower, the images stay in your head. They are not projected into external space like a hallucination, and they lack the detailed quality of a perception or a hallucination. 
You actively create such voluntary images, and you can revise them as you please. In contrast, you are passive and helpless in the face of hallucinations. They happen to you, autonomously. They appear and disappear when they please, not when you please. I'm going to pause for five seconds to give you a chance to stop the video and practice writing a summary of this passage on your own. There are many ways to summarize this paragraph effectively, but here's one I came up with. Mental images we create ourselves differ from hallucinations in three significant ways. They're not perceived in physical space, they're less detailed, and they're within our control. Based on this example, what strategies can we use to write an effective summary? When summarizing a source, you want to focus on the most significant point. This will allow you to identify and eliminate less important details. If the passage you're summarizing makes several points you want to in include, you can condense it by organizing them into a list. Make sure to summarize the point that's most relevant for your argument, which may not be the main idea of the passage. This will put you in the best position to place your ideas in conversation with the ideas of the source. Yale's Porfu Center for Teaching and Learning offers several additional resources that can help you paraphrase effectively and avoid plagiarism. Our Strategies for Paraphrase webpage covers five effective paraphrase techniques, with examples of each. We also give students and faculty direct access to Turnitin. You might know Turnitin as a plagiarism checker, but we've tried to make it a tool for learning by allowing students to access Turnitin's feedback. This allows you to check your summaries and paraphrases for plagiarism before submitting your work. And if you need help understanding your Turnitin report, our page on Writing with Turnitin offers guidance on how to interpret Turnitin's feedback and revise your paper. And if you'd like to meet with a fellow scholar to discuss strategies for using sources, the Graduate Writing Lab offers one-on-one -on -one writing consultations where you can ask questions and get feedback on your work. I'd like to thank several colleagues who've collaborated with me on other projects that have shaped this presentation. Alfred Guy, the Porvo Center's Director of Undergraduate Writing and Tutoring, and Karen Gosling, the Director of Yale's Office of Educational Opportunity. Several ideas in this presentation were adapted from a workshop Alfie, Karen, and I created on academic honesty and using sources. I'd also like to thank Lauren Gonzalez, the Graduate Writing Lab's Assistant Director of Scientific Communication. Lauren helped me better understand the scientific conventions around author prominent and information prominent citations. Finally, thanks to you for watching this video. Engaging the work of other scholars is how you put your ideas out there to reshape and advance our knowledge. I hope you feel more prepared than ever to make an impact on the world.